Baltic Dry Index. Some factors collapsed 80%. The Shemitah of 2015 produced the greatest collapse of oil since 2008. It collapsed commodities, earnings, retail profit. And going into this Shemitah, there was a difference. The center of the world economy was not America, but China. The China, the Shemitah of 2015 wiped out 43% of the Chinese markets in two and a half months. Has to be the greatest crash in world history. It was the worst year to make money in 78 years. Back to the Great Depression, 1937, year of the Shemitah. As far as day crashes, of all the years of the 20th and 21st century, of the top crashes of the stock market, 20% of them took place in a single year, the Shemitah of 2015, and in a single month, the month of Elul, which is the Shemitah's month of nullification. And the Shemitah, which means fall, ended the American age. You may not have caught it, but America was dethroned from being the strongest economic power after 141 years. Now, we don't have time to go into much except to say that our lives and blessings are not in the hands of Wall Street, but God. And, what, and uh, what's in the mystery of the Shemitah is coming true, but unfortunately what's in the harbinger is also coming true. America is following the trajectory of ancient Israel as it not walks, but races away from God. Its fall is accelerating. And now the ball is already rolling down the hill, and we don't need a president now who will push it more. All we need is one who won't stop it, and it will roll even faster. We have one candidate who promises to make America great again. But without repentance or return to God, you cannot be great again. That, that is the essence of Isaiah 9:10, the vow of the harbinger. And I won't say, but Donald Trump is actually, I put him in the harbinger years ago. You have to find it for yourself, but he's there. On the other hand, we have this quote, deep-seated religious beliefs must be changed. Who said that? Joseph Stalin, Fidel Castro? No, Hillary Clinton said that. Your belief in the Word of God must be changed. Why? So abortion can increase. The predicament of having no good choice can itself be a sign of judgment. Our only hope is the Lord. Our only platform is revival. Let's pray. Father, have your way tonight. I ask in my weakness, be strong in your power and speak Lord, your word, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus. Amen. The message tonight will go into the cosmic, the practical, the personal, the prophetical, the eschatological, or end times, and your calling. How you are fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend to the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. At the dawn of existence, an angelic being turns from light to darkness and declares he will ascend and sit on the throne of God. Thus he must destroy the works of God. God said, let there be, and there was, this fallen being says, let there be not, let there cease to be. He becomes the destroyer of the works of God. God created the universe. Then he brought forth a new work. He brought into the world a people, a new nation, the children of Israel, the Jewish people. And he said, you are my witness. The Jewish people, the very existence of the Jew is the witness that God exists. But if the children of Israel are the witness of God on earth, then the one who says, I will sit on the throne of God, will especially seek to destroy them, to wipe the witness of God off the face of the earth. And so there exists a mystery in human history, a war against the Jewish people, a war that defies time, that stretches back to the ancient world and to the modern world, that defies geography from Russia to England, Berlin to Tokyo, a war that defies explanation. It was there in the ancient world, in the medieval world, in the modern world, in the communist world, in the capital world, on the left and the right. And the reason it defies natural explanation is because it is not natural. It is supernatural. Behind anti-Semitism and this war against Israel and the Jewish people lies a supernatural force, a supernatural being. The Holocaust was not natural, it was satanic. Parents who send their children to blow themselves up to kill Jewish people, that's not natural, that's satanic. Anti-Semitism is a fallen angelic phenomenon. That's why no, no natural explanation can explain it. It's beyond time and space. It's irrational because it's demonic. The Jewish people are dealing with nothing less than a fallen angel. In Zechariah 3, 
Satan is accusing the Jewish people through Joshua the high priest representing them. And the book of Revelation records Michael wars against the dragon, Satan, but in Daniel 12 it says that Michael stands for the Jewish people. So the devil's chief adversary in warfare is the defender of the Jewish people. And the dragon wars against a woman who gave birth to Messiah. That's Israel, the war of the dragon against the Jewish people. The enemy hates the Jewish people with a satanic fury. And so the Jewish history is a supernatural phenomenon that bears witness both to the existence of God and that of the fallen angel known as Satan. The link is so direct that even the name Satan is Jewish, Hebrew. It comes from the Hebrew word Satan. From the Hebrew root to Satan is to resist. He's the resister. It means to accuse. He's the accuser. It means to attack. He's the attacker. In the Hebrew of Zechariah 3 it says that Satan, he satans the Jewish people. He especially satans one people. So that's why the Jewish people are so accused, so resisted, so attacked. For he was there in Pharaoh when he charged the chariots, he charged to the Red Sea in a fury of rage against the Jewish people. And as the Israelites cried out, knowing it would be their destruction, it was the first massive manifestation of the satanic rage against the existence of the Jewish people. And the rabbis marked that day as the first attempt to annihilate the Jewish people. It's the 19th of Nisan, Nisan 19. In a small Austrian village called Rano Am In, a baby is born, given the name Adolf Hitler. He is born on a Hebrew date of significance. He's born on the 19th of Nisan. The same day of the Pharaoh's first attempt, the enemy's attempt against the Jewish people. The Nazi party was heavily into the occult. Their mythology, their symbols, their swastika were pagan occultic symbols. Hitler was a disciple of Frederick Nietzsche, the man who coined the phrase, God is dead, and wrote that man must replace God. One of his books was called Antichrist. Hitler was his disciple. He was a man possessed by the fallen angel, and the nation itself would become possessed. Hitler hated God and Christianity for being Jewish. He obsessed about setting up a kingdom that would last a thousand years. Where did he get that from? Why was Hitler, the most evil of men, so obsessed with destroying the children of Israel? Because the most evil of beings who possessed him is also obsessed with destroying the Jewish people. Think about it. The Bible describes the Jewish people as a flock, the flock of the Lord. God is called the shepherd of Israel. Messiah said, I am the good shepherd. But the enemy is alluded to as a wolf. A wolf wars against the sheep. And when a flock gets separated from its shepherd, as in the Jewish people from their Messiah, it becomes defenseless. So when the Jewish people wander the earth, God said in Ezekiel in prophecy, my flock wander the earth as sheep without a shepherd. They were attacked by the beasts of the field. And the chief beast of the field to attack sheep is the wolf. Strange mystery. What was the name of Hitler's headquarters? The wolf slayer. What did he call his navy? Wolf packs. What exactly does the name Adolf mean? Adolf is German for the wolf. The enemy is real. Hitler died railing against the Jewish people, a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. So have other anti-Semites throughout history. They rail against a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. Why? Because it's the enemy talking through them. Because the enemy knows he fears that a Jewish kingdom will lead the world and will lead to his end. That's why he's afraid. But the enemy also wars against one other specific people, those who follow the Messiah. Not a physical people, but a spiritual people from every nation grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. And so whatever's of Israel he hates. So he's pursued them from the beginning of the age to this day, from the lions of Rome to the persecution we have seen around the world and the first fruits of persecution we are even seeing here. I remember in the early days of Beth Israel, we were meeting in a church. And the church told us we had to leave, and I only had one service to, left to announce it. The future of the congregation was at stake. It just began. For several reasons, I had to be real careful about how I phrased it. As soon as the announcement left my mouth, a man in the front row falls backwards in a seizure. On the floor, it throws the whole service and the announcement into chaos. Three years later, we outgrew our first building. We had to, we had to make the same announcement that we had to be leaving. As soon as the words came out of my mouth, a man flings backwards in a chair in a seizure. It's like deja vu. And then a second person flies back in his chair, another seizure. 
Meanwhile, in the bathroom, another person has palpitation, falls down. Now there are three people on the floor. Outside our service, we didn't have one. We had several ambulances who had no idea what was going on. They said, what are you doing in there? <laughs> Same situation. At the exact moment of vulnerability, there is a war, a cosmic war. What does it have to do with you? Everything. The enemy wars against anything in the image of God. But he has two specific wars against the children of Israel, the Jewish people, and the spiritual children of Israel in Messiah. Think about it. We here in this room represent both, even both as one. You are the epitome of both. You represent the coming together. The translation is this movement is the, set in the center of the wrath of the fallen angel. And if it's dangerous for the Jewish people to be in a war and not know it, how much more dangerous for you believers and Jewish believers in this movement to not know the war that you're in or the magnitude or the gravity of it. You see, all of Jewish history, you look at the fury of it and all that has happened on this earth. Think about all that and the hatred. And think about all the persecution of Christians. Now, combine them together. That's what we're dealing with. Whether you're a Jewish believer or you're a believer joined to the Jewish people and Messiah, you are a threat to the enemy. This movement is a sign of the coming of Messiah and his kingdom, which is the destruction of the enemy's kingdom. That's why we're such a threat to him. And that explains why there's been so much against this movement and against you from the beginning to stop you, to discourage you. If a man is in a boxing ring and he doesn't know he's in a ring, he's going to lose. How much more we need to know we're in that ring and we are in a championship bout. Saul, Paul said, we are not unaware of his schemes. He doesn't have one, he's got many which include accusations, he's the accuser, divisions, conflicts, temptations, he is the tempter, money, pride, sexual immorality, unforgiveness, idolatry, attacks, he's the attacker, attacks on your home life, your marriage, your family, your walk, your health, your finances, your reputation, slander, gossip, persecution, false reports, anxiety, fear, and more. We often recognize the outright attacks, but we don't often recognize the many other attacks. The enemy will seek to get you sidetracked with distractions from your calling, from your time with God, with busyness, with the urgent but not the important. You need to know what God has called you to and you need to hold to it. He attacks with strategies of substitutes to put something in your path in front of your eyes that's a substitute for God's best, what he has for your life and your ministry. And you have to say no, and you got to hold out. It's not just hold out for what is good and not only say no to sin, but hold out for anything that's not his best. In Ecclesiastes it says, he who breaks a hedge, a serpent will bite him. If you break a hedge of the natural, there's a chance there's a snake in that, in that hedge. Well, if you break a spiritual head, you'll likely, or hedge, you'll likely be bitten by the enemy. Hedges are your boundaries, safeguards, guidelines what you will do, what you won't do, what you will allow in your life, what you won't. You must build strong hedges to protect you. Hedges around your eyes, what you'll look at and what you won't. Hedges around the internet, what you'll see. Hedges around your marriage, around your, around your sexuality, around your singleness, around your ministry, around your time, around anything that could tempt you, around your prayer life. Hedges and whatever you need them. Before I was a messianic rabbi, I led a Bible study. I didn't have much experience in ministry. I get a call that a young woman in the Bible study is going to commit suicide tonight and she wants me to come over right away. I rush over. Her father opens the door, welcomes me, calls her down and leaves. She comes down in an evening gown. And I'm thinking, what happened to the suicide? She says, let's sit down and talk. She said, we're sitting down. She's got bowls of snacks and hors d'oeuvres. I'm thinking, this is a suicide with hors d'oeuvres. She puts on a videotape of a movie before God. It's the story of Joseph. It's just at the point where Joseph is being tempted to be seduced by Potiphar's wife. And then I feel something in my head. It's her fingers running through my hair, which I've never had before. I'm watching Potiphar's wife trying to seduce Joseph, and she's trying to seduce me. And I'm thinking, I want the suicide now. I'm praying, Lord, save me out of here. It says, with every temptation, I'll make a way of escape. I see the door. Finally, I literally push her away. I get up from the couch. I say, I have to go. I literally force my way out of the door. Meanwhile, on the television said, Joseph is forcing him away, away, says, away from Potiphar's wife. But I kept my clothes. 
It's a good thing. I get outside and I'm furious. I determine from now on the next suicide call, I want to see the rope. I want to see the pills. I want it to be a real suicide. I'll deal with it. But it was my fault because it was a hedge that I should never have broken, never gone there. The enemy was trying to destroy my ministry before it happened. And there's a key in Proverbs that doesn't only say stay away from temptation or the adulteress. It says stay away from the door of the adulteress. The key is don't just stay away from that sin. Stay far away from the door of the sin. Build your hedge far from the sin. Fight sin before it becomes a sin. When it's the first trace, put it away. Keep far from the situation that will lead to that sin, and you'll be strong, and you'll be victorious. And it's not enough to build your hedge. The key is once you build them, don't break them. Most of the time you won't need them, but that one time it'll save your life and your walk. Another key, the enemy is a serpent. Serpents go for the gaps, spaces, holes, openings. I remember once I was driving to our annual congregational picnic, and I, was, I went into a speed trap. The sign said 45 miles per hour, and then suddenly it says 20, and you don't see it. And all of a sudden I see lights in the rearview mirror, and I'm pulled aside. It's bad enough to get pulled over. I mean, you kind of feel like a zebra that's been caught by the, the lion, you know. But to get pulled over when you're a minister and people are passing by and they recognize you. And it's even worse when you're pulled over on the road to your picnic from the congregation and everybody's passing by and their kids are saying, isn't that, isn't that the pastor? Isn't that the rabbi? So I'm there with my head down trying to do sunglasses, trying to not look. The, police, the policeman goes back to his car to write the ticket. I pick up a Bible. I had nothing to do. I open it up. I just open it up. It says, be on guard. Be watchful, for your enemy the devil prowls around as a roaring lion looking for one to devour. Now the police weren't the enemy, but the strategy is there. The enemy is looking for an opening in your life. He's always looking for a gap. He's setting traps. Don't give him the opening. Whatever the gap is, whatever's outside of God's will in your life, any compromise, any motive, any indulgence, it's the gap. Close it up and he'll have nothing. It says, resist the devil and he'll flee. But first it says, submit to God. First, make sure things are right with God and you will resist the devil and he will flee. As with Israel, so with us the stakes are higher for blessing or attack. The Jewish people, for them to be away from their shepherd, they become the nation most vulnerable to the enemy's attack. So get closer and closer to the shepherd and the will of God. The enemy can't touch you there. The best defense to the enemy is a good offense. Don't spend your life trying not to fall. Get on the offense. Actively seek to draw closer to God. So And so with your prayer life, your worship, your communion, it's not just essential, it's a shield. And your sword, the Word of God, when you're in a battle, use that sword. And remember, the joy of the Lord is still your strength in battle. Make God the delight of your life. The enemy will have nothing. And your praise is not just a joy, it's a weapon. Praise Him at all times, saints of God. And the chains will break. You cannot fight that which is spirit by the flesh. Your strength is no match for the enemy. For the enemy's strength is no match for the Almighty. Therefore it's written, be strong in the power of His might. Not your might, His might. And you will be victorious. Another crucial key. Serpents are cold-blooded. Which means they can go fast, but they can't go long. If you keep running, you can outrun a serpent. The Bible says the enemy is a serpent. What does that mean? It means he can go fast, but he can't go long. Evil can't go long. It has its moment, has its day, but it will lose. The things of God go long. They're eternal. So key, don't get caught up in the temporary. Look to the eternal and don't give up. Keep going. Keep going no matter what, and you will outlast the attack. You fall down, get up. You fall down again, get up again. You keep falling down and getting up, you're going to cross the finish line and you're going to win the race. Keep going, keep pressing on, no matter what. Keep walking, keep serving, keep praising, keep seeking, keep going higher. And when the attack passes, you're going to be standing. Very crucial key, rarely spoken of. There are certain kinds of serpents that specifically go after eggs. They are egg swallowers. And this is a manifestation of the spiritual. Because the enemy not only goes after what is used against him and for God, but he goes after that which will be used of him in the future. He see, he's a preemptor. He seeks to preempt what God has for you, what God has for the movement. 
the serpent and the egg. So the enemy in Pharaoh seeks to destroy the babies before Moses can be the deliverer. In Herod, he seeks to destroy the children before Messiah can be the deliverer. So when was the greatest outbreak of satanic fury against the Jewish people in the world in history? It happened just before Israel came back into the world. Just before all the prophecies were going to be fulfilled, all hell breaks loose on the earth, World War II and the Holocaust. I remember the day that an Indian evangelist came to Beth Israel and invited me to go to India. The believers of India all traced themselves to a Messianic Jew, the Apostle Thomas. So they asked me to go as a Messianic Jew and walk in the footsteps of Thomas. Ultimately go up the mountain at the end, big finale, where Thomas was killed. And, and we'd go there. I said, yes, we saw amazing things. But the moment I said, yes, all hell breaks loose in the congregation. Unstable people, accusations, crazy chaos. As we proceeded towards India, a strange thing happened. The travel agent apparently took off with our money to Spain. Every day there were false reports. We couldn't even tell what was true or not. When I headed to the airport, I had no tickets. On the plane heading to India, I look out my window, and I see pieces flying by. It was the engine. There were pieces of the engine. And then the pilot says, we have to land. Yeah, because the engine was falling apart. In India, we're in a car from the Taj Mahal. A truck crashes into us, drags us down the road just on the second day. There was a radical Hindu movement that had just come to power. And, and, and they are, we see something. They had been killing, killing Christians. All over India, we found ourselves followed in every place for over a thousand miles People specifically trying to get to me. 200 people appear in our videotape throughout India following us. The same people, sometimes mustache, sometimes no mustache. All different, sometimes on the stage, sometimes in a dark alley. I remember on my way to the mountain of Thomas, a giant billboard of Satan sticking his tongue out like mocking us. I said, I don't need this. The chief police of the region comes over to the hotel room to tell me when you go up the mountain, I will have 300 men, commandos guarding you. And then he says, I have a question for you. And I figure he's going to ask me a security question. He says, tell me about the end times. I'm like, what? He says, you, I have never met a Jew who believes in Jesus. You know about the end times. Tell me. And then he says, I am not leaving this room until you give me the Jewish blessing. He bows his head. I give him the blessing. I felt like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, in the ruby slippers. I had no idea what I stepped into or the war that was against me, but also the honor of it. That's who we are. Everything was trying to stop me to go up that mountain. I go up that mountain, and there's a, Christ, a Christian parade in front of me with floats representing the story of the Bible, and I get stuck behind the float representing hell. And on the float, there are all these Indians dressed up in red suits, and they're playing their part. They're shouting at me, mocking me, and I'm going, oh, I don't need this either. And at one point, they get out, and they want a picture with me. So it's me surrounded by all these demons with horns, putting up their, their finger behind me like horns, you know. I'm thinking, this is not right. Then I ascend the mountain. I meet a man on the way, and he says, God told me there's a curse on this land, and a Jewish man has to go up, come to India, God told me, and go up this mountain like Thomas would and not get killed. I said, I'll try. <laughs> it had been scheduled that after I spoke on the top of the mountain, I would go out into the crowd to get to the torch of Thomas, which I brought here with once and I get up to preach, I notice that all these people who've been following us all are standing at the place where I'm supposed to go out. And I preached as if it was my last message. At the last minute, they changed the plans and had me stay back, and they brought the torch out to me. Somehow that footage got on ABC World Tonight, Peter Jennings. I don't know how. But at the very end of the mission, we have a celebration dinner. And the man who had been my chief protector in the, in the natural, is standing across the room in front of the table. Just as I'm about to pray, he falls backwards in a seizure, crashes into the table. The man never had a seizure in his life. Doctors were never able to find the explanation. He never had one again. We had never before seen the power of God or the enemy as we did then. We were a lightning rod. And before the journey ended, I told a massive crowd of Indian people about the Messiah and the Hebrew marriage gave a call, and we saw about 70,000 people commit their lives to Messiah. That's what it was all about. But the enemy knew that from the beginning, and he tried to stop it, and all the attacks were actually a sign of what was going to happen at the end if we could see it. The harbinger began with revelations that came to me when I was at Beth Israel, and then the Messiah conference, I shared it. But before the first revelation came, just before, all hell breaks loose. See, we had an amazing phenomenon at our congregation. 
A lot of our women had received the exact same supernatural prophecy. They clearly heard each of them were to marry me. So the time came when I announced to the congregation that there was a woman in my life, well, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, or like many women scorned and many who sit on the front row. The week after I announce it, they're sitting on the third row. The next week, the middle row. The next week, they're in the parking lot. They're out. The only thing worse than those who left were those who stayed. One woman started putting posters, windshield, on every windshield accusing the congregation, me. Another went around to all the churches. It was the enemy's moment. It was chaos. It was like every day we had three new crises. One of the strategies of the enemy is to overwhelm you, hit you with one thing, then another thing, a barrage to discourage you, make you panic, make you give up. You know the word panic comes from the god pan. It's a pagan word, and God's children should have nothing to do with paganism, so like panicking. So in the midst of attack, do not panic. Stay in God's peace. All this took place just before the harbinger was about to come out. And then once it did, once I spoke it, a different attack came. It was as if the enemy knew what was going to happen. We didn't. And all hell broke loose again. The, the town and the landlord decide to destroy our building after 15 years. They started talking about it, and then they decided to do it. We had hundreds of people with no place to go, and we had a deadline to leave. It was our, fell on the, on all days, it fell on the feast of Sukkot, of dwellings. We're going to lose our dwelling. It appeared to be the end of the ministry. We closed it up that day, had no place. And the very next day after we lost the building, another town, the town of Wayne, New Jersey, Board of Wayne, votes seven to nothing to give us a building three times the size of the first. And the ground where I first shared the harbinger was now in ruins. They destroyed it. Ruins. And over the top and from the ruins rose Walmart. Now Walmart has a book department. They don't have a lot of books, but they carry one called the Harbinger. So on the very same ground where I first preached the Harbinger, and the enemy went crazy, the Harbinger is going forth to America as a book. The enemy seeks to preempt the purposes of God before they happen. So he specifically will attack powerfully what is going to be used. And the fact that the enemy has so attacked the Messianic movement is not a bad sign. It's the opposite. It's a sign to us how great is the calling upon us to which we are to rise and how glorious the mantle is that we're to take up in the last days. We are not to let the attacks discourage us. Just the opposite. You are to be encouraged at how great this calling is. Now, as the last days unfold, as we near the time of the kingdom, what would we expect of the enemy? As the days of Messiah's kingdom approach, his attacks will increase on the Israel, the Jewish people, and on all who truly follow Messiah. That's why the world is turning more anti-Christian, more anti-Israel. Since we last met, since the Supreme Court struck down the order of God's creation in marriage, the progression of apostasy and persecution has accelerated. Right now in California, the Senate has introduced a bill which threatens to lead or force into apostasy or shut down every Christian school and university in California. While we were here during the conference, the Russian parliament passed a law making evangelism illegal, even in your own house or in a casual conversation. In Iowa, a law was passed that threatens to shut down any worship service and any pastor or rabbi who makes a transgender person uncomfortable. On television cartoons now, God is openly mocked and blasphemed. Just recently on Disney-owned ABC, an episode of a fairy tale character or a, a show called Once Upon a Time ended with Disney and actually ended with Dorothy and Little Red Riding Hood presented as lesbians making out with each other on national television before our children. Just the other week, a veteran army officer was physically dragged out of a service that he was conducting by army personnel because he mentioned the word God. As the end time progresses, the enemy will war all the more furiously. And we are both, we are from both camps. So congratulations, we are in the big leagues. We are in the big leagues. We are harbingers of the kingdom, the first fruits of Messiah's coming. The age began with Messiah, then Messianic Jewish believers, then Jew and Gentile in Messiah. So now again we've got Jew and Gentile in Messiah. Now again we have Messianic Jewish believers. That's a sign preceding the return. 
And Messianic Jewish believers, we have returned on the earth, and the enemy is not happy about it. Ever since I was called to speak in Washington, major left-wing organizations have put me in their crosshairs. Everything I say it's a, it gets twisted no matter what. They call me the end-time rabbi. At least they're calling me rabbi. It's kind of respectful there. But I'm encouraged because the enemy is especially against us. What does that mean? It means God is especially for us. And if this is the hour for us to be warred against, it's also our hour to shine and be lifted up. Last month, Glenn Beck asked me to come on his show, and I with Glenn Beck, you never know what he's going to do or ask. And this time, they didn't tell me the subject, which they always do. I, and they, I'm praying, and, they say, and he, says, they say he wants you there for the full hour. I'm thinking, no subject, no, I don't know what to do here. I'm in the hotel praying, Lord, have your hand on me, and have your hand on Glenn Beck. Just before the show begins, he says, I'm going to take this in a different direction. Like, show opens up. He says, can I ask you, how did you come to be a believer? I said, yeah, you can ask me that. So the Glenn Beck show opens with me giving a testimony of salvation as a Jew coming to Messiah. And then he follows it up with another question. He says, can I ask you, how does a Jewish person come to believe this? I said, that's a good question. I spend the next part of the Glenn Beck show talking about how it's Jewish to believe in Jesus. Yeshua, his real name is Yeshua. He fulfilled the prophecies, the most Jewish thing in the world, to be a Messianic believer. I end up giving the ironic blessing on the Glenn Beck show. I don't know what happened, but the, the Spirit took over. It's a new day. Recently I was asked to speak again at the United Nations. I don't know why and how, but this time it was a global summit on sustainable development. I'm thinking I preached on a lot of things. But sustainable development is not in the top 10. So I said, forget the, so I said, Lord, what am I going to do? I said, well, forget the UN format, try God's format, and speak a, instead again about sustainable prophecy. So there were people from all backgrounds, Muslims, people with head coverings, all sorts of things. And so being in the United Nations, I said, what do they need? I said, let me preach on the Abrahamic covenant, how it's good to bless the Jewish people and Israel, and a bad idea to curse them. Then I spoke of the persecution of believers. Then I got into end time. So let me go all the way. Let me talk about end time prophecy and following Messiah. I was pretty sure at that point I saw some turbans spitting around and some smoke going up from their heads. I gave the speech, I, and then I took off right there. I don't know if they passed a resolution against me or not, but the very fact that the door opened is a sign, these are new days. Great is the opposition, but great is our moment. Great is the chance to become great in the Lord. Many of you know the mystery ground from the harbinger on its, that on its first day, as a constituted nation, America was dedicated to God, and on 9-11, the destruction returned to the exact same ground. America was consecrated to God on ground zero. But let me tell you another mystery that's not in the book, because I didn't know it. What was ground zero before America existed? Turns out it was a farm. And the keeper of Ground Zero was a man named Joris Ryerson. He was a believer, a Christian, and a minister. Ground Zero was called the Ryerson Dye Farm. And he felt that New York City was becoming too sinful even back then. So he planned for a new land, a new ground, to become the replacement of Ground Zero, the new Ryerson Dye Farm. So he, he found a new land, purchased it, lived there with his family, replaced Ground Zero, and dedicated the land to God. He even had services there, prayer, worship. He was even friends with a man who ushered in the Great Awakening. Had him come to that land, ministered there, prayed. The, man, the keeper of Ground Zero and the man who ushered in the Great Awakening prayed together, had services on that land. For 300 years, these were the two lands of Eurus Ryerson. One would become the nation's dedication ground and Ground Zero. What about the other mystery ground, that second land, that redemption of Ground Zero? Where was it? It was across the Hudson River. It was in New Jersey. It was off an Indian trail. It was in the town of Wayne, New Jersey. The other mystery ground is the ground on now which rests our building. Beth Israel sits on the mystery ground. We own it. The ground of Eurus Ryerson. We had no idea. The harbingers appeared on the first land of Eurus Ryerson. The harbinger message went forth from the second land of Eurus Ryerson. And that's where, he, that's where they prayed in the Great Awakening and all that. We left our building on the 300th anniversary when he left Ground Zero. And we came to this land on the 300th anniversary when he came to that land. And it was, here's the thing. It was only because of the enemy's warfare against us that forced us out of the old place and put us on that ground. 
It was the enemy's attack that brought us into our destiny. And that's the thing, people. We are not to fear the attack of the enemy or any evil. First, because God promises that if we stand in Him, not only will we not be defeated, we will triumph over it. Number two, because not only will the enemy's attack not defeat you, it will actually be used to bring about the purposes of God in your life. So why should you fear that which is actually going to bless you? The brothers of Joseph meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The most joyous Hebrew holiday, Purim, was brought to you by Haman. And through the death of Messiah comes the blessing of salvation. I will turn their mourning into joy. There was a little boy born after World War I in Germany and given the Hebrew name Aaron. He grew up, he watched his nation taken over by Hitler and the Nazis, a nation under demonic possession. A satanic war began to destroy the Jewish people. The dragon wanted to destroy the seed of Israel, especially the children because they were the future. And the noose began to tighten around him. And then came Kristallnacht. And his parents saw what was coming and they tried desperately to gain access out of Germany, but they couldn't because the nations were closed. Finally, they were able to get a way to get their child out. They, one day they brought him to a train station. There he said goodbye to his mother. His father said, you, will never, you may never see her again, and he never did. It was the final goodbye. He departed having no idea what would happen to him. He ended up on a ship with Nazis and Jewish refugees together, moving through the submarine-infested waters of the Atlantic. The ship before him was sunk, but he survived, though much of his family didn't found a wife, started a family, that German boy was my father. The enemy tried to destroy the seed of Israel, but God gave the promise that no matter what came against them, they would not perish from the earth because God is real. They would survive, otherwise I would not exist. If it wasn't for the enemy's war against the, our people and the God's promise to preserve us, I wouldn't exist. And you wouldn't exist. We would not exist. We are a miracle by God, and we are the end game. We are ultimately what it's about in Messiah. I only came to Messiah because I was hit by a locomotive train. And being hit by that train, it was the second time I was almost killed in a short time, hit by a locomotive train, I said, you know, it would be a good idea to get saved now. <laughs> Jews need signs. I needed a train. But I had no idea how. But I remember from Hebrew school that God met Moses and Elijah on mountains. So I found a mountain. It was nighttime. I reached the pinnacle, knelt down on a flat rock, gave my life to the Lord. Years later, I decided, let me return to the mountain of my salvation. So it was nighttime. I come up with a shofar, a Bible, a talit, a flashlight, found the rock. I open up the Bible in the dark with a flashlight. It opens up to Ezekiel. It says, the enemy says to you, Israel, I've got your mountains. It goes on to say, you will take the mountain back. Strange, I'm reading it on a mountain. Had a great time in God's presence. Had the talit sound of the shofar. Next day, I'm at Beth Israel, the service. A woman waits online. She has a gift for me, a framed drawing she had just purchased from a store. It was a drawing of a man standing on top of a mountain with a talit blowing a shofar. I said, hmm, that's something, because last night that was me. I was on a mountain with a talit and a shofar. The woman says, which mountain? I said, you don't know the mountain. It's where I came to the Lord. She says, which mountain? I describe it to her. She says, I know that mountain. I said, really? She says, I live at the bottom of that mountain. I said, really? She said, do you have any idea what that mountain is? I said, no. She said, that mountain is dedicated to Satan. I said, really? Well, I got saved on top of it. She said, on top? That's where they gather to worship. I said, really? Well, I came to the Lord on top on this flat stone. She said, on the stone, that's the altar. That kind of explains why my walk has not been usual. And then it hit me. I remember that on that mountaintop, I had seen words written on the rock that always puzzled me. It said, no Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. Now, you know, most believers come to the Lord. Most of you have a nice carpeted sanctuary or living room. I come to the Lord on a satanic mountain. You got a pamphlet that says, God has a wonderful plan for your life. I get no Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. At the time I thought, who on earth would write that? Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan, who would write that? Finally the mystery made sense. It was Satan worshipers who wrote that. No Jew, but it wasn't Satan worship. It was Satan who wrote it. 
The scripture says, the enemy says, I have your mountains. For 2,000 years, the enemy's doing everything he could in his power to stop the day when the children of Israel come back to their Messiah and return to God. That is our sacred ground. And I said, too late, Satan. This Jew has returned to Messiah and to the sacred ground, and this is now the mountain of my salvation. You see, 2,000 years ago it was Messianic Jews, Messianic disciples, apostles, messengers of Messiah who brought the word of salvation to the world, and that really messed it up for the enemy. So he's been trying to do everything he could to stop us from coming back, to stop us. If we come back, stay on the sidelines. If we, stay, if we come back, stay away from fulfilling your calling. But now we are back, and we are dangerous to the kingdom of hell, and we need to know it. And so he does everything he can to stop you, to hinder us, to sidetrack us, attack us. So he did to them in the book of Acts. He warred against them with everything he had, he, yet they would not be stopped. They would not be hindered. They would not be put on the sidelines, knock them down. They bounced up again. The more the enemy tried to stop them, the more he said, oh yeah, now we're going to press on even more than before. Put them in prison, the prison doors open. Put them on trial, they use the trial to preach Messiah. Put them in chains, they start a prison worship service with a whole lot of shaking going on. Persecute them, they rejoice. Threaten them with death, they don't care. They press on in the power of the resurrection. And that torch is now passed to us. And this is the time of our greatness if we rise to it. It is passed at the same moment that an anti-Christian, anti-Israel global culture is returning to the world as of the book of Acts. Many of you have been praying, oh, I wish I could live in Bible times. Congratulations. Your prayers have been heard and answered. Welcome to your biblical times. And if you don't know how great your calling is and the power that God has upon you, then the enemy surely does. And whoever you are who follow Messiah, the enemy's tried everything he could to stop you, to wound you, to cripple you, sidetrack you, disqualify you, snare you, stumble you, destroy you, but don't give up. The very fact that there's a battle means something big. It means your life is important. Your life matters. Your life is worth fighting for. So fight for your life. Fight for your victory. Fight for your purity. Fight for your freedom. Fight for your calling. Fight for your destiny. Fight for that which God put you in your mother's womb to fulfill. And if all hell is warring against you, has warred against you, is warring against you, don't you be discouraged. No, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged because he knows something you don't. All those attacks are just a sign of how great are the plans, how high the purposes, how glorious the calling and the future that God has planned for you and which you will see if you don't give up. Just press on and you'll see it. You see, it's a dead giveaway. The greatness of the battle is a giveaway how great the calling is. Don't ever fear the enemy, and don't fear the end times, because no matter what it looks like, the fact remains you are still on the winning side. Fight that good fight of faith. You keep going with confidence, and not only will his attacks come to nothing, it'll actually bring about the purposes of God, your destiny. The victory truly is yours. You must take it. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses and so great a mantle, take up that mantle. Embrace your fight. Don't run from the problem. Run to the problem. Run to the giant with confidence, with power. Take up the mantle of the first messianic believers, Jew and Gentile. You get knocked down, you get up again. You find yourself in chains by the power of Messiah, you shake those, shake them off. If the enemy attacks you to hinder you, you say, oh yeah, just for that, I'm going forward twice as strong as before. You bounce back. You press on. You rise up. You fight your good fight.